So tonight's talk will be recorded and we'll be uploading it to YouTube uh, in case somebody wasn't able to make it to the talk tonight. We will have it available there. Um, I'll get things started by introducing myself and uh, the other OM staff who are here tonight. My name is Lisa Terich. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Oshawa Museum. I'm joined tonight by my co-worker Jill Passmore, our Visitor Experience Coordinator, and tonight's speaker, our archivist, Jennifer Waymark. We always like to start our presentations. with the acknowledgement that the Oshawa Museum is situated on the traditional territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. Our work on these lands acknowledges the signatory community of the Williams Treaties, as well as the Mississauga Nation and other members of the broader Indigenous community for their resilience and their long-standing contributions to the area now known as the Durham Region. I'm really excited to be introducing tonight's guest speaker. Jennifer Waymark is the archivist for the Oshawa Museum. She has been with the museum since 1999 and in the position of archivist since 2000. As archivist, Jennifer has authored and co-authored several books on local history, written numerous articles, presented at both provincial and national association conferences, and developed online and outreach exhibitions, taking the lead in researching a more diverse look at Oshawa's history. And that's one of those stories that we're going to be telling tonight. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Well, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all warm and safe and cozy in houses and out of the snow. Tonight, I'm going to be speaking to you about a brand new research project that we're working on. Looking at Oshawa's early Jewish history and learning a little bit more about the Oshawa community. So we are fortunate enough in Oshawa to have several fantastic historic and culturally important institutions in our community, be it the RMG or Parkwood Estate, the Ontario Regiment Museum or the Canadian Automotive Museum. But what makes the Oshawa Museum so unique is that we are the only museum in Oshawa whose focus is on the history of the community. Our mandate is to tell the history of Oshawa from First Nation settlement until today. While we certainly talk about the businesses and industries that helped grow Oshawa to what we know today, we try to frame the experiences of our community into a more national and at times international perspective. Our collections become the basis on which we research that history of our area. Research is one of the main focuses of our site. There is a clear understanding of the importance of ongoing research to help us better understand the history and growth of this area. Each and every one of the staff have ongoing research projects that we are currently working on and research is used to write publications, blog posts, develop online traveling or museum exhibits. We also work on becoming the place to find books on local history, those that we have written and published and those that have been written and published by others. This talk will focus on a community within Oshawa that does not typically appear in our local history books, as we focus on the early history of the Jewish community here in Oshawa. Now, this is by no means an exhaustive history of the Jewish community here, but it is an overview, looking at some of the experiences, families, and businesses that are part of our local Jewish community. This talk is part of a larger project that we're working on at the museum, a project to write a new book on local history that tells the stories of our community that have, over, that have been overlooked in the past. And, yeah. To properly trace the story of Oshawa's Jewish community, it's important to start at the beginning. This helps to understand the landscape in which those who immigrated and then settled in Oshawa were received. That being said, early settlement of Jewish people in Canada coincided with the Europe European colonization of the Americas. 
While Catholics prevented Jewish travelers from settling in New France, they chose to settle in the British colonies to the south. One of these families was the Hart family, who were extremely wealthy and very influential in British North America. Ezekiel Hart, whose picture is on the left, was an important political figure in Montreal in the early 1800s. He was the first Jewish person to be elected to the legislature and helped shape laws which were designed to secure the place of Jewish people in Canadian, uh, in Canadian society, that they would be treated the same as other settlers. As most of the early Jewish people in Canada settled around Montreal at this time, it was also the site of the first synagogue in Canada. Sheriff Israel in, in 1768. Many synagogues were built across Canada soon after this, concentrated in larger cities like Toronto and Montreal. Up until the late 1800s, the Jewish population in Canada remained fairly small, although those who are here found successful lives. Many Jewish immigrants came to Canada between the period of 1880 and 1920, during a time of acts of violence and anti-Semitism throughout Eastern Europe. The factors that, which made Jews immigrate from Eastern Europe in mass numbers during this time were usually religious, political, social, and economic. Barriers to freedom of religion and politics, as well as social and economic prosperity, made it really difficult for immigrants to succeed in their home country. Persecution was another reason, notably random acts of political violence that, was no, that were known as pogroms. A lot of people first hear about pogroms when they start looking into genealogy as the reason for why their ancestors arrived in Canada during this time. People facing this kind of discrimination sought out two things, access to life and liberty. This considered, they often wanted to end up in the United States, but came to Canada instead. The prevailing thought was it was easier to get into the United States through Canada. The majority of new immigrants settled in Montreal, Winnipeg, and Toronto. This was because there was already an established community with infrastructure there to support them when they arrived. It would have been difficult for new immigrants to settle in some place like Oshawa, where, where there was no pre-existing community, especially because most of the arriving immigrants had very little money, did not speak English, and may have struggled with reading the language. Most immigrants also traveled in family structures, meaning that they often had young children to raise. This meant that families needed the support of communities in order to build their new life in Canada. In Toronto, many people who arrived from Europe during this time settled in the immigrant community known as St. John's Ward, where there were friends and family, as well as synagogues and access to kosher food. The ward was centered at the intersection of what is now Bay and Albert Street. For many of these immigrants, the beginning of their life in Canada came with many challenges. In addition to trying to navigate a new language and culture, Jewish immigrants in the ward faced a great deal of discrimination. Christian missionaries would often wait outside synagogues like the Holy Blossom Synagogue, which is pictured here, and harass members of the community. The missionaries often took advantage of their poverty and offered them resources that they needed in exchange for participating in their church. They also tried to pull Jewish kids towards them and to visit with the missionaries with things like food and candy. The Jewish families that lived in the ward looked to local authorities for help in trying to remove the missionaries from within the area. However, most of the authorities sided with the missionaries and refused to help. Despite antagonism from Christian missionaries, many Jewish families had a lot of success living and working in the ward, earning enough income to move to places like Kensington Market, as well as leaving Toronto and moving to smaller cities throughout Ontario. There, they would start businesses and develop their communities. 
However, it's important to say that the Jewish Canadian that Jewish Canadians were not and are not monolithic. They had different homelands and languages and expressed different politics. Some were Zionists, some were not. There were also members of the community who were upper class and spoke English, allowing them to assimilate into Canadian communities more easily than the working class. For this reason, all Jewish immigrants had a very different experience coming to Canada. It was one, not one singular experience. Many immigrants didn't come to Canada with a great deal of money and they would enter the workforce through peddling goods. Before the emergence of department stores, peddling was really important part of the economy as it connected people with resources that they needed. This was the case for many Jewish immigrants until the mid 1920s. As the 1920s brought economic growth from local industries, many Jewish families chose to move out of Toronto and Montreal into smaller cities such as Oshawa. The thriving industries attracted many families to the area as it seemed like a great place to start business. They brought with them all the money that they had available they were able to purchase houses, build buildings, or build, build businesses, and set up community structures. In the early years, there was absolutely no community infrastructure to support Jewish families arriving in Oshawa, so they would have to organize this themselves. There was no synagogue, which meant that they continued to belong and travel to their home synagogue in Toronto. Toronto. Either that, or they met at Shlubach, which means synagogue in Yiddish, within a home or a gathering space. Where there was no place to practice, they would either, often gather in a room of someone's home. Throughout the 1920s, the Jewish community in Oshawa would often gather in rented halls and community centers, one of which belonged to Engel and was known as Engel's Hall, located on Simcoe Street. The growing community meant a need uh, for a place to congregate. The Oshawa Hebrew Congregation was officially formed in 1926, and its first president was Mr. Hyman Engel. Before this, the Jewish community uh, was reported to meet at people's homes as well as halls. Around this time, 1928 or so, the Jewish community pooled together funds to purchase a seven bedroom house located on 45 Albert Street, which they would use as a synagogue. This house was meant to be the home of the new congregation. And it was in this home that the Jewish community gathered for almost 30 years. A synagogue within a home is called a shidblok in Jewish culture. There were incredible, they were incredibly important for immigrant communities in North America. This is where the Jewish communities gathered in small cities for years before they were able to fund the formation of a synagogue. At the same time, the Jewish community in Oshawa hired a Hebrew teacher for the community. The picture above is called Hader class, and which was taken here in Oshawa around 1924. A Hader class is a program for children, often run by a rabbi, where Jewish children learned about religion and culture. This is a great example of how Jewish families who were new to Oshawa came together to establish a community during this time. Hyman Engel was part of a group of people who moved to Toronto from Toronto to Oshawa with his family in the early 1900s. Just like many other immigrant Jewish families, the Engels relied on the larger Jewish communities in Toronto before they could go elsewhere to build their business. Around 1905, Hyman and his wife Annie moved to Oshawa with their six children. He worked in the ready to wear business, opening a storefront at 16 Simcoe Street uh, North. The Engel family became very important to the foundation of the Oshawa Hebrew congregation. Before the Oshawa Hebrew congregation purchased a home on Albert Street, they often gathered at Engels Hall, which was located above his store at 16 Simcoe Street North. Engel was not only the first president of the Oshawa Hebrew congregation, 
but he was a member of many other Jewish organizations. They were extremely generous with their wealth and often gave money to different causes that would impact the Jewish community. Most importantly, they funded Jewish immigrants who wanted to enter into Canada. At the time of his death in 1930, the Angles owned two, sto two storefronts in downtown Oshawa and lived at 76 King Street East. Before moving to Oshawa, Hyman Engel was a member of many organizations, such as the Independent Order of Bunai Brith, the Maccabees, as well as a large congregation on Bay Street in Toronto. His experience with these groups assisted him when he worked to establish a formal congregation here in Oshawa. He was successful, and he was the very first president of the Oshawa Hebrew Congregation in 1926. Hyman and Annie's youngest son, William Engel, was a very successful track and field athlete. He was the city champion and went on to represent the University of Toronto at various tournaments throughout the 1920s. He also competed in the Maccabee Games, which is an international Jewish sporting competition, often held in Israel. This is an example of one of the many people in Oshawa who were successful in unique ways. The Collis family. According to the 1921 census, Max Collis and his wife, Dora, resided in Aurelia with their six children, Morris, Bessie, Zelda, Sarah, Elsie, and Abraham. They moved to Oshawa in the mid-1920s. In 1928, Max Collis ran a secondhand goods store located at 8 Church Street, now Center Street, here in Oshawa. His son, Morris, worked in the store as well. According to the 1929 city directory, Max worked at M. Collis Furniture and resided at 88 Church Street with his family. His son, Morris, ran the secondhand goods store that was still located at 8 Church Street. The original owner, the original owner of the building at 78 and 82 King Street West was Mr. Max Collis. According to the 29, uh, 1929 Vernon's directories, Mr. Collis operated a furniture business known as M. Collis Furniture. The M. Collis Furniture Company was in business for approx from approximately 1929 until 1988, almost 60 years. The family also had an additional location of the M. Collis Furniture Company located in Port Hope on Walton Street. The Collis family was a prolific business family here in Oshawa. Max's brother Isaac Collis owned another business here, a clothing store named I. Collis and Sons, also located on King Street at 52 King Street West. Isaac's sons, Samuel and Mac Collis, also worked at the store, and his daughter, Anne, was a clerk. <clears throat> this is a picture of Anne Collis taken on King Street here in Oshawa in about 1926. She's sitting on a motorcycle that they used for deliveries. According to the 1921 census, Isaac Collis, brother of Max Collis, immigrated to Canada from Russia in 1901. He was married to his wife, Yito, with whom he had three sons, Samuel, Mac, and Dennis, and two daughters, Ava and Annie. The family resided at 52 King Street West, just above their clothing store. The building at 52 King Street West has since been demolished, and the lot now forms part of 40 King Street West. As a part of the 19, as of the 1940 Vernon's directories, Max Collis and Isaac Collis continued to run their respective stores, and Isaac's son Samuel owned and operated another clothing store located at 2830 Simcoe Street North, simply known as S.B. Collis. The, the Collis family is connected to the Wilson family, owners of Wilson Furniture, a long-standing business in downtown Oshawa that celebrated 85 years of operation in 2019. Ava Collis, daughter of Isaac Collis, married Ed Wilson, who opened Wilson Furniture in 1934. According to the 1928 Vernon's directory, 
Ava Collis had worked at her father's business for some time. After the M. Collis Furniture Company closed in 1988, King's Flooring and Drapes moved into its location and, continued to operate out of 70, and continues to operate out of 78 King Street West as King's Flooring Limited. A popular cafe and caterer, Berry Hill Food Company, is currently located at 80 and 82 King Street West. Wilson Furniture continues to be a long-standing business in, the, in downtown Oshawa and is still connected to the Collis family. Oscar Black arrived in Oshawa in the 1920s. He settled in Cedardale area with his wife, Claire. They quickly opened the Cedardale Dry Goods Store that they operated out of their home at 730 Simcoe Street South. In 1933, Oscar opened Black's men Menswear, located at 70 Simcoe Street North in downtown Oshawa with his brother, Philip. Shortly after, they opened Black's Ladies Wear, located at 72 Simcoe Street North. Oscar chose to operate the menswear store and Philip the ladies wear store. Much like the Engel and Collis families, the Blacks were very active within the Jewish community. Members of the synagogue since its beginnings the family continues to be an important part of the Jewish community. Son Louis is a long-standing member of the synagogue and a font of information related to the growth of the Jewish community here in Oshawa. The model shoe store was opened in the 1930s by Morris Martyr. The store was originally located at 32 Simcoe Street South before moving to its final location at 55 King Street East in the late 1960s. Morris Frank Martyr was born in April 1898 and died on April 1st, 1982. He was born in Brody in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, now the Ukraine, or now Ukraine. His family arrived in New York City about 1902. He met his future wife, Sarah, who was visiting New York. They got married and ended up settling in Oshawa. Sarah had a brother already living here. Soon after, they opened the model shoe store on Simcoe Street. In the 1960s, however, there was a big fire that engulfed several businesses, including their store. After the fire, they chose to reopen the store at a new location, 55 King Street East. When they first settled in Oshawa, they lived above the store. After renting for some time, they were able to purchase a house located at 632 Somerville, which they owned until Sarah passed away on February 21st, 1985. Morris's parents were Jacob Martyr and Malka Molly Gallitz, then Martyr. Jacob, the great-grandfather, was born in 1869 in Brody. And Malka was born in about 1871 in Podokum, Men, which is also in Austria-Hungary, now Ukraine. They lived in New York City, where they emigrated to in about 1902 with their children, before passing away sometime in the 1920s. Much like the Engels, the Collises, and the Blacks, the Martyr family was very active in the local synagogue. In particular, Morris was very active and acted as president of the synagogue for some time. This photograph from the Ontario Jewish Archives is titled Bunai Breath Dinner, 1945, and describes a group made up of people from Oshawa and Peterborough. In the photo are many members of the Collis family, including store, store owners Mac and Isaac Collis. Benai Brith was an immigrant organization formed in 1843 in New York City, although Toronto developed its first chapter only a decade later. Benai Brith was one of the first Jewish international organizations. Their mission is human rights. One of the early founders of the organization said that it was formed in order to challenge, quote, the deplorable condition of Jews in this, our newly adopted country. At the beginning, their service was to provide relief to grieving families to make sure that they were supported. As they expanded, they continued to provide support to Jewish families, both locally and internationally. 
This is an example of what is known as Landmaschaffen, land which is where, quote, immigrant, which is a, quote, immigrant benevolent organization that were responsible for supporting local Jewish immigrants in various ways. This included mutual aid, hometown aid, and social fundraising. Over time and through the world wars, these organizations transitioned to fighting anti-Semitism at home and internationally. However, the 1930s saw a decline of participation in these, partially because the immigrant population was dwindling and many people who had immigrated from 1880 to 1920 were successful and no longer needed to rely on community organizations for support. However, these organizations were essential in the early years where many new immigrant families struggled to thrive in Canada and the United States. They were also, also crucial for forming social and business connections. Throughout the 1920s, many people in, Osh in Oshawa's Jewish community belonged to multiple organizations and even formed Oshawa chapters. The two pictures here, we see Sam and Dorothy Dine, owners of a pharmacy in downtown Oshawa in the early 20th century. They also owned an additional pharmacy on Jarvis Street in Toronto. On the left, we see Sam wearing his sergeant uniform. Sam enlisted in World War I and World War II, as did many Jewish Canadians. On the right is Dorothy Dine. This picture of Dorothy is titled, quote, Closing of Canteen at 44 St. George Street. 44 St. George Street, located in Toronto, was a popular meeting place for many Jewish groups and organizations, and was often the place for social events. We take a look at Dorothy's fun outfit. This could have been a fundraiser. During this time, the Jewish community was fundraising to challenge the most prominent issue affecting Jews internationally during this time, which was immigration. Although many Jewish Canadians were fighting for Canada in the World Wars, Canada maintained a very strict policy against Jewish immigration in the 30s and 40s. These policies were explicitly anti-Semitic, but hidden behind a ranking system of potential immigrations. This system favored immigrants that were white, Anglo-Saxon, and English-speaking. There was a strong preference for British immigrants. The Jewish Immigrants AIDS Services, or JIAS, was formed in the early 1920s and became especially uh, useful in the later years when Jewish people were finding it increasingly difficult to enter Canada. If Jewish people from Eastern Europe were admitted entry into Canada at this time, they faced cruel treatment by border control and often risked deportation back to the country that they were fleeing. In a couple of instances, the JIAS reported that border control actively prevented them from bringing kosher food to Jews that were held in custody. For many reasons, the JIAS actually recommended that Jewish people go elsewhere as Canada was too strict and too harsh on new immigrants. There are a couple of reasons for slowed immigration during this time. One of them was anti-Semitism. The other was the Great Depression. In general, the Canadian government rarely accepted new immigrants as there were no jobs to go around. However, as World War II peaked and countries around the world learned of the atrocities of the Holocaust, it became clear that Canada was unconcerned about what was happening to Jewish people in Europe. Throughout World War II, Canada continued to be uh, to oppose Jewish immigration. Even with anti-Semitic policies attempting to limit immigration of Jewish people to Canada, the population did in fact grow. By the end of 1948, the Oshawa Hebrew Congregation purchased Llewellyn Hall, located at 138 King Street East from the United Church of Canada, along with the lot to the east of it, as it had outgrown the home located on Albert Street. The congregation began to use the building for services by July, 1949. The building also provided an opportunity for the congregation to offer living accommodations for a rabbi. Rabbi M. Norden moved to Oshawa from Germany and lived with his family on the second and third floors until 1952. The former living and dining rooms were used as the main sanctuary. 
During the week, Hebrew classes were held in the large west room, and the rest of the former home were utilized in whatever manner was needed, such as committee rooms or places for recreation. By 1952, the congregation had once again outgrown its space, and a permit was sought to alter the building. It soon became clear that rather than renovating the building, it would be best to build a brand new building. On July 8, 1952, the official sod turning ceremonies were held. Two elder members of the community, Mrs. S. Black and Mr. Felix Berg, were on hand to turn the sod. The new building was constructed by contractor Harry Goldman for around $75,000. The congregation chose to sell a portion of the western half of the, lot of, of the lot to the city of Oshawa to help cover the costs. The city constructed the municipal parking lot on this site. At the time the lot was sold, there was a condition that members of the synagogue be permitted to use the lot on the Sabbath. Beth Zion Synagogue officially opened in 1956. The opening of Oshawa's first synagogue meant a large celebration. Many members of the community were invited to the event, including conservative MP Michael Starr, as well as religious leaders from around Durham. At the time, Mr. M. Schwartz was the leader of the Hebrew congregation. In his celebratory speech, he announced that the purpose of the synagogue was to be a place for, quote, worship, study, and sociability. The synagogue remains a place of congregation. When it opened in the 1950s, there were few Jewish congregations in the area. Now the Beth Zion Synagogue is one of many Jewish synagogues in Durham region. The Jewish community in Oshawa continues to be small but tight-knit community. I was fortunate enough to work with several members to create a short video highlighting the history of some of the families, the businesses, and the holidays and traditions that are part of their community. It was a genuine pleasure to get to know everyone and to learn more about the different experiences and traditions embraced by the Jewish community. Canada is multicultural, which means that people and traditions from many other countries and cultures are noticeable and celebrated. More likely than not, you're going to meet many people and experience many situations that are unfamiliar to you. Developing your understanding of other cultures or cultural awareness lets you have more meaningful interactions with those around you. You're building your respect and empathy for other people and celebrating your differences as well as your similarities. The more we learn about the many different people and cultures that make up our communities, the more rich our lives will be. This is a list of just some of the sources we use through this research project, and I'll leave that up. Now, if there are any questions, uh, we can open the chat for you. There is also the Q&A function, so please uh, go ahead and either use the chat function or use the Q&A, and uh, we will be happy to address any questions that you might have. Also, Jen's last slide had um, the intro picture from a project that we did that Jen started to allude to as well. Um, we created a micro doc filmed by Empty Cut Media and uh, we're sharing uh, in the micro doc it's sharing the stories from Oshawa's Jewish uh, community members and we'll be pleased to share that video uh, after some questions are answered. We'll be sharing that and I've also dropped the YouTube link for that in the chat so if you decide that um, you want to watch the video at your leisure another time that's great. It's easily found on the Oshawa Museum's YouTube channel. I'll ask you a question, Jennifer. Well, what I was going to say, I will respond. I saw that, um, yes, my pronunciation of some of the words, I admit, was challenging. And I was working with uh, one of the members of the local community just to, to try and wrap my, literally wrap my tongue around it. So I will certainly continue to work on that so that I can improve it, <laughs> because I certainly want to be able to uh, pronounce them uh, as close to as properly as possible. And I do apologize because apparently I was sounding funny. You got to love technology, right? 
not at all. No. Uh, so we do have a question which came in. I heard that there was a Jewish youth summer camp located in the Oshawa Creek Valley, north of Somerville and Cedar. Would you be able to address that? Yes, yes, there was. Um, it was it was not just a youth summer camp. My understanding was it was um, a camp for members of the Jewish community to go uh, spend some relax, rest, relaxing kind of time and just congregate together. So. Wonderful. I'm just answering a question in the chat myself. Thank you very much for, for asking that. Were there any stories that surprised you when you were doing your research? No, I wouldn't say surprised. Um, honestly, I've just enjoyed learning more about you know, the, the traditions and the cultures. Um, it's very different from what I've grown up with. So just having a chance to sit down and chat with Mr. Black, like he was, he, you'll see him if you watch the video. Um, wonderful. Like he, we only showed you snippets uh, of what he and I sat down and chatted about. Um, it was so amazing just to listen to him tell the history of his family and his memories of the early community, um, talking about uh, his family store um, and just talking about the changes that he's seen in Oshawa. Um, it was a true joy and genuine pleasure just to be able to sit down and make that connection and, um, and just learn. This has been a learning experience for me as much as uh, it is. So I'm just sharing what I have learned. Um, it's an ongoing research project. None of this, none of my pre research projects ever end. Um, I will continue to dig up more. There's additional families, early families that didn't get into this talk that I'm learning or digging up more information on. So this is no, by, by no means an exhaustive history. It's certainly something that I will continue to, to research and dig and, um, you know, learn more about and share what I find with you. Is there a cemetery? No, there's no cemetery in Oshawa. The closest is in Toronto. Uh, so another question coming from to us uh, from the chat. Was the community centered around Simcoe and King and clarification on where the first synagogue was located? Um, well, the first one was located, uh, Angles Hall, which I wasn't technically a synagogue, uh, but it was a meeting place, uh, was located, I think it was 16 Simcoe Street North, um, was Angle Hall. And then there was, um, they purchased a home the congregation purchased a home at 45 Albert Street, which is today where the Big Bell office is. Um, when they outgrew that um, home that they were using as a synagogue, they purchased Llewellyn Hall, which was uh, located pretty well where um, the synagogue is today. Um, and they used that uh, as their meeting place or as their synagogue until they uh, built the new one, which I guess isn't even that new anymore since it was built in the 50s. <laughs> Was there a summer synagogue in the enclave in North Oshawa? Um, and they've gone on to add, uh, there was actually a year-round settlement there from what they understand. That's my understanding as well. Um, that's something that I'm trying to learn more on. Um, none of the participants um, that I spoke with in the project had any memories of it. Um, Mr. Black didn't have any memories of it. Um, so that's something that I'm trying to learn um, more about. So that is, I'm hoping to kind of pull through the newspapers and see um, what additional information I can find on that settlement up there. Did you learn anything about the Jewish cattle farmers? No, that's actually new. If you have <laughs> any information on Jewish cattle farmers, if you could send it to me, that would be awesome. No, we, um, a lot of the focus was kind of looking at um, the... Uh, at the businesses, because a lot of the families, when they moved to the area, started a business, <clears throat> pardon me, started a business and then lived above the business. So it was kind of looking at that um, 
growth uh, and development of the of the businesses and the families through kind of the downtown core area. Yeah, I'll be sure to drop your email address in the chat if anybody wants to share anything additionally. Uh, we are going to mm -hmm. encourage that. And um, uh, there's just a few more other comments, I guess, in the chat, which I'd like to just address. And then I'm going to go ahead um, after I, I'll, I'm going to just address these first. Um, as you dig more, check out the Jewish farm families that were also part of the greater Oshawa community. So once again, more about Jewish farmers, please share this information. <laughs> uh, it would be interesting to have a map locating the places you note as you go along. Not everybody is as familiar with Oshawa as you are. Uh, some of these places, uh, the Oshawa Museum has an interactive map online exhibit called Discover Historic Oshawa. It's found at discoverhistoricoshawa.com. And um, it, we've got Engels Hall, we have 45 Albert, and we have the synagogue listed on that website. So if you go to discoverhistoricoshawa.com, you can uh, use the search function, you can explore the map. Where will you be able to find this on YouTube? Uh, at the Oshawa Museum's YouTube channel, uh -huh, youtube.com slash Oshawa Museum. We will hopefully have this chat up before the end of the week. And um, the I see address, a question. Yes, um, <laughs> two more questions. Um, one of them is more of a comment. Uh, I read in the newspaper about 2004 to 2007 that there was a Jewish cemetery that was abandoned. But Not that I not that I've come across in my research. Um, my understanding is the the closest one has always been Toronto. Uh, and you're asking, and it was asked where the address of the present synagogue is, and it's 144 King Street East. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. And... Um... Yeah, I will go ahead. I will ask you, Jen, to stop sharing your screen. So that I will get the video ready. It's all of this moment of pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> Wizard of Oz. We go Zoom. Sharing. So, uh, as we were saying during the presentation, we were really excited to partner with a local media company, Empty Cup Media, to create this micro doc called Traditions and Celebrations, the story of Oshawa's Jewish community. It is a fun and informative look at Oshawa's Jewish history and favorite Hanukkah traditions and customs as shared by members of the Jewish community. I'm gonna go ahead and get this video started. And at this point, you should be able to see my screen. So I love Jewish music because it's as diverse as the Jewish diaspora itself. Even if you don't know how to speak Hebrew or you don't understand the words of the prayers, there's this comfort in the tunes and the melodies and the experience of singing or praying together as one is a very powerful thing and one of the reasons why people come to synagogue is to sit and sing and pray with others. <laughs> I'm Lena Gillis Satsman. We moved here in June of 1967 and moved into the new apartment buildings at 380 Gibb. 
And at that time, the Oshawa Centre was just being built. Hi, I'm Dave, and I've lived in Oshawa since I was born in 1970, so uh, 51 years. Went to the same high school as my dad. <laughs> he went to high school O'Neill when O'Neill was the principal. <laughs> Hi, my name is Louis Black. My father came here in 1920. I was born in 33. Now I know where I got my ears from. Remember, everything I tell you is from memory. So there may be the odd mistake. My dad opened Black's menswear, and that was around 36. It was at the northwest corner of Prince and King, right across from the current Michael Starr building. But the earliest Jewish couple in Oshawa was in 1900, approximately. And it was a Swartz family, S-W-A-R-T-Z. Now there were other early Jewish settlers uh, the Angles, they had a department store, two stories, on the first block of Simcoe on the west side, north of King. One of the early uh, uh, Jewish businesses in Oshawa was my grandfather's business. He must have started it in the 30s or 40s, maybe a bit later, I don't know the exact timeline. It was called the Model Shoe Store. It was right downtown Oshawa, right across from the Regent Theater. And I just remember it was there, and then later on when I was a kid, it became a tattoo shop, and then another store, and then a soup kitchen, and now it's becoming something else. My dad spoke all the languages, so he's very successful in business. My uncle bought my dad out, and he opened Ladies Wear Only on Simcoe Street at 70 Simcoe Street North. And Wilson's Furniture Store, of course. That's the Sherman's. Their grandfather started it. So it's been here for a long, 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 long time. Those days, business was a pleasure because people were basically honest. My father would arrange credit on a handshake. When we moved to Oshawa, there were probably about 60 to 70 families, and there were about 10 or 12 younger families. Very tight-knit and very supportive, and I think that's really important, so you have that sense of community. Louis Black's wife played bridge with my husband, so they were big bridge buddies. Along with Oshawa, the community grew during the war. I think it prospered during the 50s and 60s. Some of the early places uh, the Jewish community socialized were mostly it was in shul in the synagogue. Every Saturday was the was the services, the main services, and after the services you'd have what's called a kiddush. More than that, had to be the most welcoming people I've ever met in my life. They were very active in the Jewish community. I grew up in Orange Crescent, and that's where uh, the rabbi's house was too, and we'd get invited over to the rabbi's every once in a while. So I know that this synagogue was originally, the Jewish community would meet at Engel Hall, which was um, just a building owned by the Engel family. Yeah, I went there actually. In the early days, we had a very small community. We met in houses. We had a succession of rabbis. Some were much better with kids than others. In 1952, they bought the old McLaughlin house on 40, 144 King East. There's a picture somewhere of my grandmother with a shovel breaking soil. That's the inside of the current synagogue. I usually sit right there. And that white back seat is my father's. I won't sit there. One of the things you see in, in a lot of Jewish music is it will take one verse out of Psalms or out of the prayer book and then just repeat it almost like a mantra. <laughs> So this is the bima, the pulpit of the, of the synagogue. This is where we lead the services from. Um, I'm not a rabbi, I'm a lay leader in the congregation. So if I am uh, leading services or if I'm dealing with the Torah, I will use a traditional talit, a prayer shawl, and a kippah on my head. All of these symbols around the ark 
represent the shields or the symbols of the 12 tribes of Israel. So each one of these represents one of the 12 tribes. Above and the top of the ark, we have two lions, Lion of Judah, and then we have the Ten Commandments. And then above, there's a crown and the letter Kaf and the letter Tav, which means Ketel Torah, or the crown of the Torah. So this is the Torah scroll. Often you'll see Torahs are decorated with crowns and or breastplates just to which is sort of part of that tradition of adorning the Torah to make it special. So the Torah scroll is actually on these wood spindles, which are also called Eitz Chaim, or the Tree of Life. This Torah is, is quite old. Our synagogue has been around for a long time. So some of them, they were donated by different people over the years. And what's in here is the five books of Moses. And there's sort of two types of laws that are in the Torah. There's the ethical laws and the ritual laws. Every Saturday morning you do a different portion and then there's certain portions that are done for specific holidays. So what happens is there's a holiday in the fall called Simchat Torah and what happens is you're at the end and you finish off the end and then we have a big celebration where we take out all the Torahs and we parade them around the synagogue and we're dancing and singing. <laughs> celebration. It was eight days long. It celebrated the fact that the Jews took back Israel. Hanukkah is not a major holiday on the calendar, on the Jewish calendar, but it's a major holiday for kids. It was basically a time of fun. You get presents during it, but the only reason you get presents, like in, in the old country and in, in like Eastern Europe, they never got presents because it's so close to the time of Christmas when people moved to North America, I guess the kids got upset, so they just adopted it. My memories of Hanukkah are very, very simple compared to what they are now. The kids would be given a gift a day, uh, nothing big. This is a menorah. It's my family menorah, so I've had this since I was a kid. This I bought in Israel when I went to Israel in 1963 to work on a kibbutz. So it has eight lower candles because there's eight days of Hanukkah. On the first day of Hanukkah, you would put one candle here and then the main Shamas candle there. You would light this candle and then you would pick it up and because you couldn't put the match to that candle, you'd have to light it with this candle and then you would say the like, Hanukkah prayer. It was like a sing-song thing and the kids really liked it and then you'd put it back and then on the second day there'd be two candles, third night three candles, etc, etc, and then finally eight candles at the end and they'd all be burning bright. We got taught in Hebrew school that you got to be proud that you're Jewish and proud that it's Hanukkah so you were supposed to put it in front of the window so the whole community could see that you're lighting your menorah so I remember doing that. Hanukkah for us was um, you know lighting the candles. We got one present uh, my mother made potato pancakes and, you know, that, that was the whole rigmarole because they were grated by hand. So there was always a little bit of skin in there, <laughs> a little bit of swearing <laughs> and, you know, crying from the onions. It was like the only time of year I got the potato pancakes, like having sour cream on them. Some people have, uh, like my dad, he liked having applesauce, but I was a big sour cream guy. I can remember my mother threatening with my life if I ever told my next door neighbor there was no Santa Claus. <laughs> so I always felt that I was very smart because I knew something that she didn't. And the same with the Easter Bunny. But my gosh, there was a tooth fairy. <laughs> So the calendar that we follow every day, January, February, March, April, etc., the one the whole world follows, follows the sun, it's the solar calendar. So the Jewish calendar follows the lunar cycle. So that's why our holidays shift. Hanukkah is generally close to Christmas every year because it follows a different calendar. It's sometimes it's before Christmas, sometimes it's after, sometimes Christmas because it's eight days long, sometimes Christmas may be in the middle. The high holidays 
are very religious. Sabbath is the most important. We just had the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, and the, uh, the holiest day of the year called Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Passover is eight days. Hanukkah is eight days. Rosh Hashanah, that whole period, is supposed to be time of reflection and thinking about what you've done and what you can do better. I don't know the population as a whole remembers who they are. My dad taught me um, about succeeding in life. Like, I mean, you want to have a good job and stuff like that, but it's also doing the right thing and helping people no matter, no matter who it is. Any person who is part of sort of the larger community to know about somebody who is part of a smaller community, no matter what it is, is that we're all people. My dad's name was Mort Martyr, and I know there's a common saying uh, uh, with my with some Christian people called WJD, what would Jesus do? And whenever I'm in a conundrum, I do WMD, what would Mort do? And usually the right answer comes to me. And I'll just, I guess that would be it. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as um, I know I do <laughs> and as much as we enjoy being um, we're just so proud to be able to present that to the community uh, much like this talk will be uh, that video is available on our YouTube channel so youtube.com slash Oshawa Museum and you can watch that video at your leisure once again, uh, thank you all so much for spending a Tuesday night with us. Uh, this was the very first talk of our 2022, I keep wanting to say 2021, and then having to correct myself. Uh, this is the very first talk of our 2022 speaker series. Our next talk is taking place on February 15th. We are welcoming author Jordan St. John for a discussion on the Lost Breweries of Toronto. So hopefully we will see you all then. And once again, thank you all so much. Have a lovely evening. Take care, everyone. Good night. <laughs>